You're listening to Buffs and Blindsides. We're here to talk about the latest in Survivor 44. Today we're embarking into brand new territory as podcast hosts and covering our preseason thoughts and opinions surrounding Survivor 44. To get started, let's let the listeners know just who the heck they're listening to and what our plans are for the season. So, who are we? I'm Tim. And And I'm Evan. Right. So... Evan and I met our freshman year of college, so we've been friends for a few years now. Um, and just sometime during the pandemic, we started talking about Survivor. I guess maybe it was season 41, right? That sounds about right, yeah. And we've just been discussing the new seasons ever since. Uh, probably gone back, discussed some of the older seasons, and figured it would be good to put our thoughts into podcast form. Because we would just, like, send texts back and forth after every episode, right? Yeah, we would watch the episodes at different times, because I always watch them way too late. And we'd have to send each other notes, like, desynced after the episode to go back and forth. Yeah, right. So this podcast is just kind of like, I guess, those notes in audio format for everyone to listen to. Survivor fans, our friends, family, whoever wants to listen to this podcast, um, they'll be able to hear those notes. So I guess if we want to get started off, how we got into Survivor, maybe um, let our fans know where it all started. So Evan, you want to go first? I would love to. Yeah. My family has watched Survivor for a long time. I remember as a kid coming down into the family room, watching late at night with mom and dad. Um... And then I fell away from it for a while. I got busy in high school and early college. But when season 40 came around and Winners at War started up, I was just really into that concept. I thought it was cool bringing these people back from that we hadn't seen since, you know, 2004. Um, and I watched that season and then I was like, I'm going to watch them all. And so during COVID, I made my way through the first 20 or so. And that was kind of where I caught up to when my family had watched it. So I skipped the middle 20s. Um, and then got to the 30s, and then I've been watching ever since, so got the new era down as well. How about you, Tim? Yeah, my, my story is actually really similar. Like, I remember watching when I was, like, really young. I think maybe the first season, probably I remember a few seasons before that, but the first season I remember, like, distinctly watching all of it was, like, probably China, so season 15 or maybe 16, Micronesia, when those aired. Um And then, like, I would try to watch them every week, um, not always getting, like, every episode, um, probably due to, like, some sports as a kid or something, falling on a weird night. So then I I fell off somewhere in, like, the 30s um, in the 2010 seasons. But then, like, when the pandemic came back and everything was shut down, like, Survivor 40, uh, Winners at War, that was, like, one of the only season, one of the only things that was on TV, really, or mm-hmm. like there's no sports or anything, so it was kind of like, oh, they're bringing back all the older people. I think I probably missed like the first five or six episodes and had to catch up to like watch the episodes live, but like getting back to those seasons and seeing all those old favorites was really cool and kind of brought me back into the fold as a fan. Um, so like, I guess for me, I'm a pretty casual fan and not like a super analytical watcher like watching every season and um analyzing everyone's moves and everything but i'm really more watching for like the different personalities like i loved watching ethan uh ethan zahn as a kid he was a favorite of mine um Uh, you gotta love ozzy when you were a kid ozzy Ozzy. yeah yeah tyson now as an adult i'm like coach was a whack job i loved him um (laughs) i look back as an adult now and i'm like I don't know how I wasn't in love with Yule as a child, but it's fine. Yeah, Yule. Yule. Gotta love Yule. Um, For sure. Yeah, so I mean, like, now coming back into things, I've become more interested in the show and analyzing all those different moves. Not really... Still, I guess, not really stressing over everything, every little detail like some people might, but uh, more interested in looking at Reddit um, and those types of things. I think Evan's probably more of the analytical person, right? I was going to say, you're smart to leave the stressing to me, but I'm definitely the nerd who will pull out the random tidbits. I probably do do a bit more of the deep analytical diving. 
Um, so yeah, should be a good time though. Yeah, so I mean, those are some of the things you can look forward to on this podcast, Buffs and Blindsides. Um, coming up, I guess we're not really one of those podcasts that's going to dive back into older seasons. We're going to focus on the current season. Um, Even though we've talked about a million old seasons so far. But. Yeah, right, right. We t- just talked about all the players from those past seasons. Um, but we're focusing on the current season, Survivor 44. Uh, after every episode, probably going to go back, talk over some of the highlights, different contestants, different moves in the game. Uh, was Jeff making stupid comments the whole time? The answer um, will not surprise you. It was yes. It was probably yes. Yeah. Um, advantages, all that good stuff. So keeping in mind that we're talking about the current season, let's go back and talk about the past seasons <laughs> and see how that kind of plays into where we're going into with this new season and some of that preseason talk. Um, yeah, yeah so I guess let's go back to where we ended off last season. So we saw Survivor 43, Mike Gabler, the Alligabler, won at final tribal council. What was the vote there? Like, I think it was every, it was six to one, seven to one, uh, something to one, however many. Yeah. Cassidy got that one pity vote, and that was it. Right. So he won basically unanimously. I think James was the one person who didn't vote for him. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. As my seeing... jaw dropped as the votes yeah, were read, right. I couldn't believe it. Right. I'd been on the Gabler was a joke bandwagon all season, but uh, really made to look right. like a fool that time. Glad this podcast didn't start last season. I'll put it that way. And have you come around to Gabler as like a winner? Or... I was going to talk about this actually later, but TLDR, yes. After sitting with the Gabler thing for a while, I love Gabler as a winner. Okay. See, like, I'm, I love big move survivor. So these past few seasons, the winners haven't been like quite up there for me. As like, I love the players like Jesse last season who are just like kind of masterminding everything. Couldn't win a challenge at the end. I think if he could win that challenge, he might have won the game. But um, yeah, I I don't really like the uh, under the radar type games. Um, And that's why this is going to be a great dichotomy, because I love that style. I I actually really did not care for the big moves era at all. and I'm very glad we're past it. I enjoy this more balance, um, more personality based gameplay that's not just who is the best strategic person and nothing else really matters. Right. So I guess that kind of those two different opinions kind of clashed with that last season. And like afterwards, people were all up in arms on Reddit, social media and everything over Gabler winning because he played this under the radar game and just kind of came out of nowhere to win. No one yeah, expected like him that he was hiding it was in hindsight. Right it was yeah, it was right there in the edit. He kept saying, I'm hiding in plain sight. Like, every confessional, I'm hiding in plain sight. <laughs> yes, and um, somehow none of us listened to him, and we all just made it a joke, but he was, and that was beautiful. Right, and then he donated all the money. Gotta love Gabler. Yeah, interesting guy for sure. So for sure. I guess uh, with that last season, do you want to get into talking about, like, some trends from the last season that we might be seeing in this new season, I guess. So for those who don't know, the two seasons were filmed back to back to back, right? So they usually have some similar twists, similar casting advantages, um, some similarities and some differences. I guess the differences are the people, which we'll get into in a little bit, but, um, what are some of those trends that we saw last season that you think we might see this season? Yeah, I think the the new era in general, all three of the seasons have been pretty similar. And Jeff has said as much as we're going to give this some time to sink in to let it play out. And so really, these are going to be trends of kind of the last three seasons, I think. Um, the main one I think that we've seen in casting is, uh, of course, the step up in diversity, which has been very welcome, has created a, a much more unique game with love that. Um, and then additionally, they've really embraced the casting of super fans. Um, 
it felt like for a while we had gotten away from that pretty hard and you know the 15s 20s kind of time and then it it came back a little bit maybe in late 20s 30s but now now it's rare to find someone in this game who is not a super fan um and that trend is definitely going to continue this season uh it might be the most super fanny season yet um we'll get into all that um also the editing has just been really different this season um it has been a lot less about narrating the winner's story and instead kind of telling everyone on the island story. A few notable exceptions, um, looking at you in 41, Heather, you got done dirty, I'm so sorry. But um, pretty much we, we get to see a lot more people's stories now. And I think the winner's edits have been a lot less conventional because we've had a lot less conventional winners. Um, so it's made it, in my opinion, for some seasons, a lot easier to predict and in some a lot harder to predict. And I've enjoyed that uh, quite a bit. Um, I think we've also seen a couple things that are playing out really differently on the island. Of course, everyone's going to tell talk about the 26-day game. Uh, I won't get into that too much. It's shortened from the 39. But we're also just seeing, because of that 26-day game, a lot less forgiving of juries. And that's kind of changed the play style that has allowed people to win. You know, we talked about the big moves era earlier. The juries are not as, a, not as okay with... Uh, like big moves people unless you are the biggest moves person right mm -hmm. like jesse would right. have won last season tim don't you agree for sure yeah, yeah i i would have loved to see him win <laughs> yeah i think if you are the biggest moves person you can definitely still win this game but if you just have like one or two i don't know if that does very well for you i think that just kind of annoys people and i think we're seeing a lot of the times in this new era people that have maintained their relationships better are getting the wins and i think we've seen that three times now Right. Right. The friend to everyone is like the winner, right? Yeah. Gabler. Three times. Three out of three times now. Yeah. Yeah. And then I think one other smaller thing we're just seeing a little bit more of is um pairs coming back. You know, early in the show we had the romances and all that good stuff. Um, but it really seemed like that pairs dynamic became really poisoned and we'd moved away from that to kind of the larger alliance structure, like minimum of a trio. And I think these days we're, it feels like we're getting back to pairs a little bit. You know, we had Jesse and Cody last year. We had uh, uh, Shan and Ricard in 41. I'm sure there's a bunch I'm forgetting. Uh, Tim, if you got Jonathan more. and Mike. Oh, Big yeah. Mike. Yeah. Omar and, yeah. you know, like six other people. Let's be real. He was a pair with everyone. <laughs> so um, just seeing more of that. And so those are just going to be some things we're going to keep an eye on here as we go through the cast. Um, and we're going to do that starting off with the Orange Ratu tribe. Oh, do you want to do that now or do we want to talk about the season first? Like some of the promotional stuff. Oh, that's a great idea. Tim, why don't you lead us in the promotional stuff? <laughs> All right. Uh, so like some of the promotions we've seen so far is like they're hyping up these big players, these dynamic players, as Jeff calls them. Um, so like just the, the from the trailers we've seen so far um here's some of the things that jeff has been hyping up just for the first episode not even just like the season as a whole but the premiere so first he was talking about dynamic players his quote dynamic entertaining fun and funny and they know how to play the game so we're going to be seeing some big personalities it sounds like just in the first episode hopefully the whole season um Maybe that'd that was really, a knock on. That'd be oh, great if ahead. they were, had big personalities for the first episode and then they just became rocks for the rest of the season. But that right. one episode just, is really good. Just robots for the rest of the season. Yeah. He's talking about some new way to get an idol. Uh, his hint about that was it's public, it's complicated. That's all he said. So right. I think in one of the trailers, they showed like this idol in like a birdcage thing. Uh, I have no clue what that's going to mean, but we'll have to look out for it. I, I'm excited. And, I've honestly I've enjoyed the way they've been doing idols uh, this this run. Uh, I like the beware. I like the kind of limited number of them. Idol changes have been good. I'm excited. Right. Yeah, uh, that would be interesting. It's always interesting to see what people do with the idols that they get. And uh, last season, we saw people getting voted out and taking each other's idols. Uh, that was always a fun turn there. 
that was um, so <laughs> you're exactly um another thing that he's been hammering home and was in the first trailer the first sneak peek was medevacs so he's talking about medical visits more medical visits than any other single episode of survivor just in the premiere so he's talking about already people getting hurt people getting who knows what dehydrated all those kinds of things and in like the newer seasons of survivor we really haven't seen that much right yeah, I don't think so. It's they, you know, a lot of the 39 day players are quick to criticize the 26 game, 26 day game as being less taxing. Um, kind of wild. All this stuff is going to happen in the first episode. Yeah, yeah. And then the last thing he said is there's going to be an insane tribal council, and he's quoted saying, first tribal is pretty wacky." That's that's Jeff's way of saying it's going to be a good time. <laughs> And not happy. just because Jeff is inserting all sorts of uh, his own commentary in there that's just, like, crazy. Um, probably some crazy uh, characters and crazy stuff going down. Maybe a live tribal. I was just about um, to ask, is it going to be a live tribal, Tim? Yeah, that's the crazy part. We've never seen one of those before, right? Never. Never <laughs> once. And everyone is really excited to have one. People love live tribals, for sure. Yeah. So those are some things to look out for, according to Jeff Probst. Uh, we'll see if these are as hyped up as he claims here, if they're as exciting as he makes them out to be. No monsters this season so far, uh, but it should be interesting. Unlucky. Um, so I guess now you want to get into the cast and talk about that a bit. Heck yeah, I do. Sounds like a good time. Um, so I think we're going to start up here with the Orange Ratu tribe. Um, heading that one up is going to be first up Brandon Cottom. Uh, he's 30, security specialist and former NFL player. Tim, any quick hits for me on Brandon? Anything about him? Uh, you know, I think NFL players or sports athletes in general, you know, they're kind of hard to read. I think some of them are just good in challenges and might be have like a weaker social game and maybe not as strategic as other players. So that can be uh, a weakness for them. But we've also seen some people go pretty far. Uh, athletes go pretty far in the game. So it's really a toss up for me. Yeah, he, he mentioned Danny, who I think is one of the better athletes or like one of the better NFL right. players to ever go have right. a good survivor game. That was promising. Um, I, I liked that mention. I think one concern I did have about Brandon, though, every answer he gave was kind of about being in the NFL. I, I felt like there, he didn't talk about much that wasn't football. You know, I think in some of the videos or in his uh, written bio that we read and made these notes for this show, um, he did say he's like a bit of a renaissance man. And he is talking about playing piano, I think, and flying planes. So he does have other interests. I just don't know if that makes you a more strategic player or a more social player that could make you better at the game other than yeah. just being good at challenges. Yeah, for sure. No, he, he had some depth to it. It was just the overtone when I was reading through the questions. I was like, what were my takeaways at the end of this? I, you know, I just read all this information. What stuck with me? You know, to your point, I did remember the, the Renaissance man line. And I did remember the piano playing, but NFL player is what really stuck out. It wasn't about how he was going to tackle the game. I wasn't sure he had a specific plan yet. Totally fine to not have one. But just right. NFL player was my takeaway. All right, you want to move on to the next person, or shall I? <laughs> Go for it, Tim. Okay, so the next person is Kane Fritzler. Uh, we got another Canadian on our hands. Uh, so Kane is a law student from Saskatoon, Canada. He's 25. Um, Canadian buff guess... is going to be huge, I got to say. You know, we were talking about this right before. I think Canada's only had two people on the show, right? And they, they both won. So... Two, two in recent memory. I don't know if they've ever cast anyone like in the earlier seasons or anything. They probably yeah. have. At uh, least the last two Canadians are two for two. So yeah, right. So we Kane's had Erica and Marianne. I think were both from Canada. 
yeah. they both won. So, um, anything stick out for you? I guess, yeah, anything stick out for you? Yeah, I, I got one word for you, Tim. Gamer. Gamer. He, Dungeons and Dragons. My man is a gamer. Um, which, you know, I think we could both say we're gamers a little bit too. Um, so we probably fit that label. Um, I just always think that's a it's a personality type, right? It, it kind of speaks to value lines. It speaks to how they go about seeing it. Like this is truly going to be a game for him is what I took from that. And I think the rest of his bio as a lawyer kind of backed that up. Yeah, I think it was interesting. Like he's this lawyer figure and I guess he did well on his exams or something and he's hyping up his intelligence but he also seems like a very approachable person and also like kind of goofy so you might not suspect that he's as intelligent as he might be yeah um, he was funny the i think his one-liner of that he's the younger more handsome tyson was the funniest thing i read in any of these intros so that i yes. think that got a laugh from me he was um, talking about tyson and zeke um as his like players that he's most similar to um so i think he he'll probably make the merge i think he'll be pretty good at like maybe deceiving people probably gonna give some good confessionals will be interesting to see for sure Mm -hmm. i also loved uh they always ask the question why will you be the sole survivor and then we sometimes get some pretty long lists and his was only because i'm quick on my feet i like that short succinct answer you know i'm gonna give jeff probst a line here but (laughs) <laughs> this is a quick game and it changes a lot and maybe not having a plan can be an asset. Maybe just saying I'm going to adapt to things as they come is a decent way to play this game. And I think he'll be pretty set up to do that. Right. He also, I do have to give one other thing is uh, recognized as being uh, one of the best or a best negotiator at a competition for Canadian law schools. And all I could think of was Daniel in 42 talking about how he's a lawyer and can negotiate and then proceed to do the worst negotiation of all time by ceding all power immediately. So I I hope Kane can back up the best negotiator mantra a little better than uh, Daniel did back in 42. Yeah, I hope so too. Um, Taking a look at our next contestant though. Um, We've got Matt, Matt Grinstead male, uh, 43 Columbus, Ohio and a barbershop owner. Um, He's a super fan. Uh, who isn't? But he was very proud of his super fandom. Any uh, any quick hits, Tim? Uh, I would just say he seems like an interesting guy. He seems like a probably a fan favorite. Absolutely. Seems nice, social. Maybe good at challenges. I know in his bio he was kind of hyping up being like an outdoorsy person. Um, some of his inspirations kind of like stood out to me he was talking about i guess shan or ben and i was just kind of mm-hmm. like dumbfounded about that i mean i guess some of my personal opinion about those players uh bleeds into that but it kind of has me scratching my head when some people like cite players that i don't really have the best perception of um That's yeah but those are some... from there yeah because like <laughs> when i saw those two names i was like what are you talking about my guy but I liked the reasons that he identified for each of them. Like, he had a very specific reason. And um, for Ben, it was that he had baggage and overcame it. And, you know, our other opinions on Ben were going to, you know, meet the door. <laughs> ben did do that very well. I think Ben took things in stride in his seasons. I think Ben Ben adapted to the game pretty well as it happened. And if that's the part of Ben's game you're picking out, I, I think that's a recipe for success. And same with Shan. Um He said Shan made others trust her, and Shan did that until she didn't. Um, Shan Shan let it get away from her towards, you know, into the merge. But um, Shan did really make people trust her early on. I think, like, everyone on that tribe had an alliance with Shan. Um, And pulling out that one specific aspect of her gameplay, I think Matt is, you know, the opposite of Kane in that he seems like he has a very specific plan for how he wants to play this game. Mm -hmm. But I like that plan, so I'm good with that, too. Right. Uh, and he also so, mentioned uh, one other person. He said he liked Elaine uh, as being just a fun uh, personality. And I think that's what we're going to get from Matt. He just seems very fun, very gregarious in the intro videos. To your point, a definite fan favorite. Yeah. All right. I think I guess we'll go. I guess where do you see him ending up at the end of the season? Do you have any idea? 
predictions where he might end up. Yeah, you, you know, you mentioned him being decent at challenges. I think that's true. I think he's going to be a good worker around camp. You know, uh, that came through in his bio to me, and he seems like a pleasant person. So I, I think he'll make the merge. Um, I don't know what his ceiling is, to be honest. I'm not sure I see him as a winner. No particular reason, just reading the vibe there. But I, I do mm-hmm. feel like he seems like a decently safe bet to make the merge, in my opinion. Yeah, that's also what I had down. I didn't put anything else except just merge. I think he'll mm-hmm. probably make the merge. So, so who do we have next? Next we have Jamie Lynn Ruiz. Uh, she's 35 year old, 35 years old. She's from Mesa, Arizona, and she's a yogi and marketing coordinator, I believe. Um, any I felt thoughts really on her? dumb earlier when I had to ask Tim to explain to me what a yogi was, but I'm glad he helped me out by telling me it's just someone who teaches yoga. I feel like I probably should have had that one with context clues. <laughs> right. Yeah. So any thoughts on her right off the bat? Well, Tim, I'm going to tell you, she's a super fan. She's seen every season of the show. Um, I'm going to my initial thought. I was reading her bio. She is my sleeper pick for challenge beast of the season. You know, um, in 42, we had Jonathan, who was the typical challenge beast. And then we had Lindsay, who kind of came on strong in the post merge and nailed these balance challenges. You read Jamie's bio and she's into things like yoga. Obviously, she teaches that, but she does swimming, meditating, uh, golfing involves some balance, gardening. Um, I just think things that will serve her really well in some of those balance challenges later on. Yeah, I don't really... I don't know if I 100% see that or agree with you. I, I, I really don't know where her experience as like a yoga instructor or she's talking about experience in corporate life and negotiating with people, how that will play into her survivor experience. Um, I'm thinking like she might be an early boot or like an early merge boot, to be honest. Yeah, that's fair. Um, I can see where you're coming from there. She did emphasize being a big relationship builder, though. And I do feel like in this new era, early relationship building backs you up a lot. So I think if Jamie can get past that initial initial little hump, I think she could I think she could go decently far. But to your point, there's a chance she had some pre-merge for sure. Yeah, I you know, there's a lot of people on this. <laughs> yeah, on this I know we're going to say that about Uh it's it's hard to predict where they're going to end up and most of it's just gut feeling some of it's just based on like archetype stereotypes of similar people and how they've done we've only seen like a minute video and a few paragraph bio that they wrote we don't know where they're going to end up but um yeah those are just our opinions so (laughs) we'll see i think we'll probably be happy to see if she goes further than what we suspected but um yeah uh so who do we have up next we got lauren harp who's going to be a 31 year old um elementary school teacher from mont bellevue texas um she's a single mother teacher i think some of those things can lend themselves well to playing this game uh how'd you feel about her yeah i mean i I don't think I had much of like from her bio. I didn't really get much out of it. Um, She talks a lot about being a single mother and a teacher, which is like respect. I'm all for it. Like, yeah, I mean, I'm hyped. I was hyped from her video. Um, I liked her video a lot. She just had a good energy about her. Yeah. She talks about playing like uh, an under the radar game, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, So, you know, with under the radar games, it's either like you're going to be an early boot because you're not doing anything for the tribe or, you you know, you're probably going to make it all the way. (laughs) So that's kind of what I said in my prediction for her. I think she'll either probably go out before merge or make it all the way to the end. I I don't really see it either other any other way. You mentioned we were talking about Jamie. There's a lot of gut feelings in here. Lauren gives me good vibes. She talks about, you know, wanting to focus on growth and adaptability and flexibility. Again, I think those are really useful skills in, thir- in you know, these new era, this new era. Um, good energy, uh, trusting, but not too trusting. Uh, you mentioned under the radar. 
there's a lot of a lot of players this game though who talk about being under the radar and i don't think we've ever had so many players who are have ever said i'm gonna play an under the radar game as we've had this season uh, we'll see how that collision goes but i think lauren will be one of our better under the radar players I, i'm expecting her to go pretty far right yeah so next up we have uh maddie pamila from brooklyn she's 28 years old a charity projects manager um i guess i the big takeaways i had here were she seems like she has like a pretty big personality um she had a pretty funny bio in my opinion i think she'll be entertaining i have no clue what that means for a game but maybe she'll be good in challenges um Yeah, you mentioned the funny bio. As soon as someone used the word feral as one of their three words to describe them, I knew I was going to like her at least a little bit. Yeah, she definitely gives off like Gen Z uh, energy. For sure, for sure. (laughs) Like like someone who's on social media and with the times. Um, She did say that she wanted to do like under the radar till merge and then come out and like show people that she's a strategic mastermind. so maybe like kind of like a cast figure in some ways, but um, I guess cast didn't really do much. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's that's fair. Uh, I think she didn't explicitly mention her, but the way she was sounding, she wanted to shape her game um, was, I think, how they wanted us to perceive Erica's game, right? Like kind of silent in the background and then have this huge coming out party at the merge. Um, that's what it really sounded like. Maddie was kind of basing her game on to me. Mm hmm. Uh, I'll be honest, I'm not sure she's getting to the merge. Like, I have her going out earlier in this one. Uh, Do you think she'll get there, Tim? And do you think her plan will be successful? I, what I put down is I think she'll be early merge or maybe an early boot. I don't really see her getting that far. This is just a prediction. I'd like to see her get far. I, I mean, I don't really know um, how things will play out, but. I'm I'm just saying early merger, early boot. Yeah, I, I think it's going to be an early boot. Would be happy to prove him wrong, though, like you said. She seems fun. Seems like mm-hmm. she's got good things to say. Good chaotic Gen Z energy. So we can look forward right. to that on screen. Um, Tim, when you look at this Orange Raw 2 tribe as a whole, who are you seeing kind of coming out of this one? Uh, do you think there'll be a strong alliance here leaving this tribe? Uh, any people that you think will definitely want to flip on this, say they make the merge? Any any big picture thoughts of this tribe? Challenge, proficiency? Yeah, see, I did say some people might be in early boot, but I think this tribe is actually really strong when it comes to challenges, maybe. Um, it seems like they do have some physical people on their tribe compared to some of the others, maybe. Um, I agree with that. So, so I don't... I don't know if I mean I'd like to see most of these people make the merge to be honest. Okay. Um, Interesting. Yeah, I'm really hoping Matt makes it. I think Matt is kind of the star of this tribe to me. Really hoping he'll make the merge out of here. But to your point, I think this is gonna be a pretty good challenge tribe. It just seems like a group that will work together decently. Right. On yeah. paper, it feels like the pieces fit nicely for decent challenges. Yeah, and I think if things don't go well, I think in the past seasons we've seen that the women tend to go out first um, yeah. before merge, which is, you know, an unfortunate reality, but I think that might happen here. Maybe Brandon, um, I mean, he's bringing physical to the tribe, but I don't know if he's doing much else. He might be stirring up stuff. Um, who knows? <laughs> yeah, we'll see. We'll see. Um but yeah, so read on this tribe. Going to be decent at challenges, we think. And hopefully a lot of them make the merge. But uh, we both kind of got our eyes pegged on. I think it was uh, Maddie, we both said might be an early boot. Uh, you said Jamie, I think, as well. Um, yeah, right. Nice. Should we get to our next tribe? Yeah, sounds good. So we've got the Green Soka tribe coming up next. Uh, and they're going to be headlined by Claire Rafson, who's a 25-year-old, uh, lives in Brooklyn, New York, and is a tech investor. Um, she'll join the super fan group as well. Um, quick thoughts. What you got for me? I think just from, uh, I guess the players that she mentioned and 
some of what she's talking about. She seems like someone who's really social, but also kind of like a sleeper strategist. Um, mm-hmm. So making a lot of relationships, but also maybe making some moves in the background. Um, I guess my prediction for her is mood. Uh, what, did I, what was I just going to say? Um, probably the merge, possibly a late boot in the game, like late merge. Um, mm-hmm. I think she's probably going to make it far. She seems like someone who's going to make a lot of friends and um, that will serve her well. Yeah, I think anyone who says Courtney Yates is someone they're going to model their game after, you know, sassy. Like, I love that. So (laughs) I I think she's going to be one of my favorite players on this season. Like, I think her confessionals are going to have me in stitches, like, routinely. Right, Um, I agree. I also, I'm a big Michelle Fitzgerald fan. Uh, I think Mm -hmm. she's a really good, really underrated winner, like, in my opinion. Um, So anyone who wants to model their game off that strategy has my vote of approval. Um, Natalie Anderson, she mentions as well, who everyone can just agree Natalie's a badass, right? So, like, if we can combine those three into one person, like, Claire is going to be amazing. Um, yeah. She, another person who mentioned wanting to minimize her threat level, um, she had the addition that I liked of she wants to team up with a bigger, stronger, more big moves kind of player to use as a shield. Um, and I liked that, having that extra step on the uh, wants to be underestimated plan. Yeah, I I completely agree. I think that's just kind of like Survivor 101 at this point. Uh, <laughs> and it's good to see that she's picking up on that. Mm-hmm. For sure. So I guess the next person we have is Heidi Lagaris Greenblatt. Uh, she's 43 from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, and she's an engineering manager. Do you have any initial thoughts on her, Evan? Yeah, again, I'm going to reference, you know, who they want to model their game off of. Uh, And she said Sandra, and I think that sounds amazing. I love chaos, and Sandra was chaos embodied. Um, uh, I also like first-gen immigrant, uh, and my favorite arguably fun fact of any contestant is that she was, like, the captain of the Puerto Rican youth basketball team when she was 12. Like, that sounds amazing. I hope she's able to beast up at least one challenge then. That would be really fun to see. Uh, How about you, Tim? Any thoughts? Yeah, like you said, I think she could be a challenge dark horse here. I mm-hmm. uh, I think that maybe for her older age, people might not suspect it, but she seems like she's probably in good shape from some of the hobbies she mentioned, and um, I think she could go pretty far. Um, as far as like predictions, I can't really get a good read. It could go either way. Uh, could be an early boot or could be one of those people who just kind of sticks it out wins some challenges and uh, makes it really far i was thinking the same way this was one of the people where when it was like how far do you think they'll go it was just fat question marks i really have no read how far heidi's gonna go Uh, she does seem like someone again that i'm gonna like so i hope she lasts a while but we'll see right who do we uh, have next? Yeah, Franny Marin is coming up next, who is a research coordinator in Cambridge, Massachusetts, <clears throat> who's 23 years old. Nice. She, um, she had a story about working at a Vietnamese nail salon for five years, despite a language barrier. As someone who worked in like a fast food restaurant, I love that story and like kind of help like how that can help you deal with a lot of stimuli and responding to things quickly. Um, what stuck out about Franny to you, Tim? Yeah, I mean, I think she gives off very, very strong Minnesota Midwestern vibes. Uh, so you gotta sure, love it. Sure. Um, us being from the Midwest, Chicago area. We didn't mention that earlier, but that's where we're from. Um, you know, she's giving off like this kind of quirky, nerdy, smart, fun, um, social, but maybe not the most socially aware player. Um, she's giving off those vibes and I think that those are some things um, present in some of the players that she did mention Sophie, Gabby and Aubrey um, who are very smart players but maybe not the most socially um, strategic or adept so what are what is your take on this yeah I think she just seemed a little more reserved um my the the person that immediately stuck out in my head as I was reading about her and watching her video um, was uh, Lydia from a couple seasons ago. Um, mm-hmm. Just 
kind of this a little bit dorkier of a personality, um, a little more quiet, a little subdued. I think she's going to have great commentary. Like, I'm, I feel like she's going to have some pretty good zingy one-liners and confessionals. Um, mm-hmm. Some of the people she mentioned were good narrators for us. And so I hope we get to see that from her. I'm I'm a little scared we won't, though. Um, yeah. I, I think Franny kind of screams early boot to me, like aggressively screams early boot. Um, I hope that's not the case. But where, where are you at, Tim? Yeah, I think she's one that's kind of a question mark to me. I could see it going either way. I guess I wrote down merge question mark. <laughs> um, I think it's got everyone going home at the merge is what I'm learning. Yeah, I think if I totaled up everything, everyone's going to the merge. Um, yeah, I really can't see where she's going. I Like you said, I think I could probably see an early boot. Um, and you bringing up Lydia is definitely a good point. I think she does give off similar vibes. Um, yeah, I, I really can't see where she's going. My overarching takeaway from reading her stuff was that she just seemed like she seemed mature in the way she communicates, but just her personality and spirit still seemed really young. Um, mm-hmm. And I don't know if that'll benefit her on the tribe she's on. It might, but I'm not sure about that. Yeah, right. Uh, looking okay. at our next contestant, we've got Danny Massa, who is um, 32, and he's a firefighter in the Bronx. Uh, firefighter is probably one of the professions that has fared best on this show throughout the years, I would say. Um, they tend to do very well. Do you think Danny's going to keep that up and do pretty well for himself? Yeah, as opposed to cops, uh, firefighters seem to have done pretty well in the show. <laughs> um, I I just can't get a read on him at all. Um, I guess he cited Jeremy as one of his influences, which makes sense because he's a firefighter also. Um, but he, I, I have no clue. Kind of seems forgettable in an early boot, in my opinion. But that's you know i feel bad saying that it's just like you don't know these people's stories and um don't know them personally but i just i can't see him going that far he seems pretty forgettable that's interesting i um i actually felt pretty differently i thought he seemed i think you know he he's a big guy he's very physical he's got that dog mentality to him uh, i think he's going to get no one's going to want to vote him out because of his challenge prowess early on. Like, I think he's going to be one of our mm. candidates for challenge beast. Um, and he also, I think he had some good comments about uh, kind of rewriting the narrative on big burly guys. That was something Mike had talked about a couple seasons ago and Jonathan yeah. a little bit too, but it really uh-huh. seems like Danny wants to take that to another level. He mentioned, you know, overcoming a lot of physical insecurities he had early in his life. Um, he's apparently really into meditation, Harry Potter, um, and he described himself as being like the personality of a background actor in American Pie 5, which I thought was hilarious. Um, he just seemed down to earth. Uh, and I think someone who's a big asset to their tribe and challenges and is down to earth is a pretty good combo to make the merge, in my opinion. Yeah, right. So if you're a guy who <laughs> is very physical and can win those challenges early on, like you don't really need to worry about having the social or strategic prowess of other characters, or <laughs> not characters, other players, right? I just think you, you need just to kinda... not, be a, not be a pain in the butt, you know? Yeah. I, I don't get those vibes not, from him at all. You just don't have to be making, uh, you have to not be making bad moves at that point. It's just yeah, yeah. be there, do your part. Um, don't do too much else. Uh, exactly. Who else do we have on this tribe? We have Josh Wilder. Uh, he's 34 from Atlanta. He's a surgical podiatrist. Um, what do you get from him? I I thought his story was really inspiring, and I thought the way he wrote about it was he he has good mastership of like the language, you know. Um, his quote that I really liked was, as a physician, I must get that individual to trust my diagnosis, explanation, and treatment plan in 20 minutes during an office visit. Um, I think overcoming adversity and being able to speak, you know, very well like that, um, just his bio was very impressive to me. Yeah, I definitely thought the same thing. Um, I just thought he, like, exudes confidence. Like, For sure. In his video he just seemed more confident than anyone else that I saw. Um, Seems like he will play the game hard. Um, He seems like someone who 
you know, I think he gives me kind of like Omer, Ricard, or Shan, Jesse, Carla of kind of vibes, like main character in some ways. Um, and I would be surprised if we don't see that. Yeah, I think one thing I, I do want to note about Josh is he is one of our like, what I am reading is not being a super fan this season. One of the only few, I think. Um, and it was in his Rob has a podcast uh, interview. Um, well, a, he's never mentioned being a super fan, which I feel like pretty much all of them do. But then uh, the only season he's ever really talked about was Micronesia. And even then he like that was his favorite moment. His players were from Micronesia. Um, but then he didn't refer to the Black Widow Brigade by their correct name. He called them like <laughs> three in the dynamic six or something. <laughs> like, I'd never heard of that before, and I feel like I, I scour Reddit quite a bit, so I thought I might have seen it somewhere if it was a thing. Um, so I just think he's not a super fan, and I, I'm not saying that's going to you know positively or negatively impact his game. Uh, it's just something I kind of want to follow and see how the non-super fan does in a season of super fans. Yeah, that's definitely something to look out for and might be pretty entertaining. Um, I think if anything, anything he'll else? be an asset, personally. Yeah, right. Um anything else on this guy no i don't think so so i think we'll move on to uh, our final member of the green tribe uh matt blankenship 27 san francisco security software engineer um we're back on the super fan track thoughts for me tim um yeah i mean analytical kind of nerdy um in his bio he's Kind of says he's like you all, but kind of goofy. Um, not a fan of peanut butter. So that was a red that's flag. A no, yeah, red flag. No for me. Um, but honestly, I have no clue where he's going to end up. I, I don't even have a prediction. I just wrote no clue. <laughs> I have no clue where he's going to end up, but I do think he's going to be someone who makes good moves, right? I, I think he's got, to your point, the analytical brain. He seems chill enough where he's not going to jump and make moves unnecessarily, like force a move or anything. So I think he's going to make good moves. I don't think he's going to control his threat level super well. I think he's going to be mm-hmm. assumed to be like underestimated for a while because he's chill. Then he is going to make a good move. And then I think all hell's going to turn loose on him and be like, oh my gosh, this guy, he's flying under the radar. We got to get him out. Um, but, yeah. you know, Gabler kind of did the same thing last year, right? He flew under the radar early, said, I'm going to eliminate Ellie. And then... Did not do anything the rest of the, did not do any big moves the rest of the game and, and won after it. Um, so I'm not, I don't think it's necessarily a bad thing, but that, that is the arc I see Matt following. Yeah, I can definitely see that. Um, I don't really have anything else to say. Do you want to move on to talking about the tribe? What is this, Soka tribe? Yeah, yeah, the green Soka green tribe. tribe. I think uh, I really liked Claire's personality. Like, I thought she was fun. I think she would do very well. In the game of Survivor, on a different tribe, and, and I think this tribe might be—I don't know if her personality lines up with this tribe's personality very well. I think this mm. tribe seems like a pretty serious group for the most part. Um, pretty like, well, let's get to business, let's let's grind this out. And she seemed a little more fun, lively. Um, I just don't know if that's going to mesh super well. It, it's got me scared for her a little bit. Yeah, I mean. Danny, Matt, and Franny also kind of give off like maybe more fun, playful vibes. Um, Interesting. Like, so I could see that. Um, but they also seem like work hard, play hard kind of people. Yeah. Uh, I mean, she's a she's a tech venture capitalist, Claire. I think she can definitely be more serious if she wants to. <laughs> Okay, yeah, and she seems like she can read people well, so... Yeah, it's not like she's, she's like, Michelle, who is a bartender, I think, Yeah, (laughs) right? Um, And her, I think her pet peeve was people who lack self-awareness, so hopefully, you know, that's not her, and she'll kind of be able to read the tribe um, and make sure she's kind of blending in personality-wise. Yeah. um, But I I do like her a lot, and I really hope she succeeds in that, because I think she's going to be so fun this season, if she can... Yeah. She's definitely a standout for me. I also thought that Josh was a standout for sure. I think those are the two standouts for me on this tribe. Um, I think they're probably going to be very strong in challenges. Um, 
I think yeah, at I this point, a read on this group in challenges, I feel like they could do like very well, or they could do absolutely terribly. I don't think they're going to be average, right? Like I kind of viewed the last tribe as being like consistently pretty good. I think this group will be really good at some challenges and just awful at others. Yeah, I think once we get to the last tribe, we can talk about this a little bit more. But mm. I did get the vibe that like okay. Ratu, the orange tribe, and Soka, the green tribe, are probably going to be winning the challenges, and then this last tribe is not, doesn't seem as physical. I had the exact same read on that when I was looking <laughs> at kind of which tribes are going to win. Uh, yeah, orange and green stood out, and p- purple not so much. That did not seem to be their forte. Yeah. Do you want to get onto that, or did you have anything else to say? No, about- I think that works for okay. me. I Yeah, I got everything out for Soka, but uh, we'll move on to the purple Tika tribe. Our, our first person up is Carolyn Wigger from, uh, she's 35, from Hugo, Minnesota, uh, and she's a drug counselor. Um, she she uh, wants to provide visibility into addiction and hope to overcome it, and I, she was just radiant. Like, she just seems like such a glowing person to me. Yeah, I, she seems, I think she can be, like, in very tough mental environments, which I guess you probably need for survivor to just outlast on those, um, all those days and some of the endurance challenges. So I thought that she would probably do well at those also seems very social. Um, for sure. Very social, probably not super strategic. At least that's the read I'm getting right now. Um, but I could see her winning immunity challenges later on. She was, she mentioned how she's like interested in authentic connections. And I think she said something about like befriending all of her new best friends out there. Um, She just seems like such a, like a happy, loving person um, that I can't imagine she will go out any other way than getting absolutely gutted by a blindside. I I feel awful (laughs) saying it, but this woman is going to get blindsided to hell and back. Yeah, I I completely agree with you or winning the whole thing you know i guess the social relationships in these past few seasons have been really important um Mm -hmm. so i could definitely see that playing out well for her um i wrote that she's honest about who she is and that's been working really well for people lately like i think mm -hmm. she owns her personality pretty well from what we've seen um and you know that was something that gabler did really well right gabler was comfortable being the ally gabler and knowing that he could go into that journey and convince them um, and I think Marianne felt the same way, right? She's just who she is. And at the end of the day, she's going to play her game. And if she makes it to the end, she feels good about her odds of winning. I can't imagine that isn't Carolyn's mindset as well. Yeah, exactly. So next we have Sarah Wade. She's 27 from Chicago. Good stuff there. Love that. Um, uh, management consultant. She, to me, seemed like one of the players where I just got nothing from her bio, or I don't think her video is even out yet. Um, could be very analytical, seems like a very smart person, probably good at challenges. She seems like she's a um, very fit person, um, but I have really no clue aside from that. Yeah, that's fair. Um, you know, one thing that kind of struck me is she mentioned three former players who followed her game off a lot, which are Stephanie, Sari, and Parv. Those are three wildly different players. And she <laughs> yeah. didn't really pull out individual attributes, right? So let's break this down. Stephanie is one of the best physical players of all time. Like, unquestionably one of the best challenge players of all time. Not good at strategy. Not no terrible social game. Like, really bad social game. I mean, she, she made it far, but challenges were always getting her there um sari who then you <laughs> flip that maybe the best social player of all time um and then parv one of the most strategic players of all time but someone who wasn't necessarily well liked which is kind of reputation stephanie had and is the opposite reputation sari had um very confident in her knowledge of the game i'm getting the vibe she's gonna just try to do way too much out there she's yeah. a super fan she, i think she's gonna want to do I think she's going to have big move by this. Um, I think she's going to be fun. I think she's going to be good TV. I don't think she's winning this game. Yeah, I can definitely see that too. I think in her bio, she actually said like she looked up to those players. And then the person she actually likened her game to most was Natalie. Um, oh, okay. Thank you. Thank you. Which, which makes much more sense. Um, yeah, that, that checks out based on the videos. I feel like that, that stacks up. 
but I don't really have any. I didn't put down a prediction for her. I just haven't seen enough to make anything, <laughs> make a prediction yet, and um, see where she might go. I think she'll be good at the game of Survivor, but I also think she'll play herself out of the game of Survivor. Yeah, I think that's 100% fair, and I could definitely see that. Um, next, next up, we've got Helen Lee, 29, San Francisco, and a product manager. I, and another super fan. Shocker, right? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> any first thoughts? Uh, you know, I... Yeah, I was definitely getting under the radar vibes for sure with her. Um, was she it mentioned... because she said how she wants to be under the radar like nine times in her bio? Just... Uh, I don't know if I had any notes on that, but it's possible that she did say that. She, she uh, said it uh, at least a couple times in there. Okay, well, she definitely mentioned Erica, Tina, and Sophie as her players that she likened herself most to. Um, kind of a quiet strategist. So I'd say, you know, same with all the other under the radar players, either an early boot or making it to the end. <laughs> Yeah, that is exactly my read. Uh, you mentioned the players that she wants to model her game off of. Those are all players that could have gone first and then ended up winning. I, I view Helen the exact same way. I, I think Helen pretty much goes first or makes final tribal. Uh, goes early or makes final tribal. Um, I, I really like what she's bringing to the table. She talks about cultural context switching. Um, you know, her uh, her parents were from China, so she did Chinese dance while she attended high school in America. She's lived on both coasts. She's just kind of been around a lot of different personalities, and it's been able to switch between them, um, which I think will benefit her. The only thing that'll be interesting about that, I think, is that Survivor isn't that same way where you're hanging out in a discretized bucket, right? It's all these people mixed together. And a recent trait that I think has been really helpful to winners has been that they've made strong interpersonal connections and then have pulled together these like hodgepodge single vote alliances that have been mm -hmm. really beneficial in taking out a big target or in getting the name off, like getting the votes off your back. Um, I don't know if she'll be able to do that super well, but I think she has the toolbox to do it. And I, I'm very optimistic about Helen's shot at this game. Okay. Yeah, I have a very different take, but I could see that too. Um, so next we have Bruce Perot. She's 46 from Warwick, Rhode Island, and is an insurance agent. What do you have to say about him? He was a really interesting guy. Um, I, I like that he made it clear that this is both a social experiment and a game to him. Um, and that he doesn't plan to play every aspect of the game, right? He talked about not being that into challenges, and he talked about that he's not going to look for advantages for a while. I like that he's trying something different. Uh, I'm curious to see how it'll work. I'm not sure it'll go great for him, but I like that he's going to try something different. He seems like a cool guy. Yeah, you saying that kind of also gives me, like, he, he in his video, he talks about being kind of like a family man in some ways. You're going to say Rock me... Troy. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm going to say Roxroy. Um, yeah, he does give me some Roxroy vibes. I hope he proves me wrong because Roxroy, I guess in some ways it was refreshing to see someone who just like played how they wanted to play, kind of not going by the standard rules of mm -hmm. Survivor. Um, so that might be interesting to see. But, you know, I... Probably don't see that paying what paying off well for him. Um, I do want to caveat and say that I think his interpersonal skills did seem quite a bit better than Roxroy's, um, <laughs> or at least like he's going to try to be more likable than Roxroy tried. Yeah, because right. I don't think Roxroy tried very hard to be likable. Um, no, no. But uh, yeah, I think Bruce seemed like he had a good personality. Um, I just feel like to you know advantages have been a kiss of death, but I still think you need to play for them. You still want some element of that control. I'm curious to see if this works. This might be a new archetype that goes forward is the just chill. Um, not not playing every second of every day. Uh, we'll see. I'm the, he's one of the contestants I'm most interested to see how far they go. Because I have no clue. Absolutely not. Yeah. Yeah. I 100% agree on that. I have no clue. Um, and he really didn't give us too much to go off of. Yeah. Um, so next we have Carson who's an aerospace student, a uh, rocket scientist, as he calls himself, um, goes to Georgia Tech, 20 years old. 
Uh, what do you have to say about Carson? Carson said that he's going to play this game like Christian Hubicki, which I think is a wonderful thing to embrace that nerdiness and go after it. Christian was the nerd that you got, that you just loved him because he like just wanted to explain it to you, just wanted to talk to you, just wanted to just wanted to hang. I think Carson gives me the vibes that he's an achiever. And I, and I think if he goes for the Christian Hubicki nerd style with kind of his achiever mentality, I think it might rub people the wrong way. See, I saw that. I saw that he compared himself to Christian Hubicki. Um and my first thought is like, okay, is he actually going to play like him or is he just kind of flexing his uh, intellectual, his muscles. intellectual muscles, right? So he kind of rubs me the wrong way. I think I, he kind of talks, he talks a lot of game, but I'm not sure he can actually pull it off. Um, and he talked, maybe... he talked a lot of game and he, he talked a lot. Like his answers for everything were right. really long. Uh, right. I just think he's going to, to your point, I think he's going to rub people the wrong way pretty quickly. Yeah. And also, just like as a fan who's on the Survivor subreddit, he's already selling merch with like his face on it with, <laughs> before the season maybe was even started. A million dollars. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. People are not too happy about it. It was kind of controversial. Um, people were like, well, he better win if he's going to. If he's going to be selling all his merch right off the bat. Um, so that kind of leads me to think he's either going to be like a first boot or he's going all the way. Like there's no in between. Um, I think he might go pretty early. This could be a comment that ages really poorly. I, I do not see him winning this game at all. Uh, I said that about Gabler last year, so <laughs> <laughs> that probably actually means good for him. But um, I, I don't know if I see him making the merch. Uh, I give him a pretty slight chance of that. I don't know. I, I, I don't get good vibes. Speaking of good vibes, this next guy. Oh, yeah. You want to talk about him? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Great vibe. Uh, 36. He's from San Juan, Puerto Rico. Uh, and he's a salon owner. Um, he just seemed like such a fun, like, lovable guy. Holy cow. Yeah, for sure. Um, gives off strong social game. Probably not as strategic. Just seems like he's there to have a good time, experience Survivor. Um just excited to be there. Yeah, that was exactly the vibe I got. Um, but one thing I, I did really like is that he owned up to that right away. Uh, he said that he wants to partner up with a strategist. Like, he's going to need someone who's going to do that. Like, he wants to work mm-hmm. with an intellectual person. Um, and I think that could work really well for him. If you get the really likable guy with the strategic mastermind, that can be a... I, we talked about pairs earlier. That can be a powerful pair. Yeah, for sure. Um, one thing I also like to mention that came up on Reddit was we have Yam Yam, the salon owner, versus Matt, the barbershop owner, and they both oh. have kind of similar looks. Oh. Um, similar pattern shirts. I think that would be funny. A funny beef, or just to see them get together at Merge or something. <laughs> dynamic duo um but i definitely see yam yam probably making the merge unless they're just this tribe is losing a bunch of challenges which i can also see um but he just seems like someone that people want to have around um so i think that benefits him well yeah i see him i I do see him making the merge to your point i think he's one of the people who's going to do better i don't have high hopes for this tribe um but i think he's one of the two that i do kind of have better hopes for I think he'll make the merge and I think he could do a really good job like flipping to the other side. I, I think he could probably if this tribe gets decimated like we were saying we think it might. I think he could do a good job just finding a new buddy from one of the other two and being like, hey, we're, we're with you guys now. Like, well, we're good. Just tell us who to vote for and we'll do it. Um, uh, I think I think Yam Yam could make a run, but I do kind of see him as like a, a mid tier player. I don't know if I like put much stake in his winners at it. Mm hmm. Yeah, so I guess getting into the breakdown of the tribe, we kind of mentioned this a few times when talking about the players and the other tribes, but I think they're definitely going to have some trouble winning physical challenges and probably the first to tribal, but who knows? We're going to have only, a medical emergency. <laughs> the so, only caveat I'm going to put on that is, is Carson does talk about how he loves 3D printing 
and that he used like recreated a bunch of survivor puzzles and has practiced them. Um, so okay. if this tribe is able to be physically sufficient, not totally physically inept, which Enough I don't, to I don't to know, the puzzle. they have to get to the puzzle. I do think Carson is probably the best puzzle doer in this season, or it'll be really funny when he's bad at puzzles. So either way, Carson on puzzles should be entertaining. <laughs> Yeah, honestly, my prediction here is I'd like to see them go first to Tribal and kind of see Carson go home. Um, I just have bad vibes from him, and maybe maybe I'll be proven wrong, but I've known too many people, too many engineers from college who give off similar vibes. <laughs> He's talking about me, I can tell. No, not you. Um, anything else to say before we get into, like, predictions for the season or our personal picks no i i think we should go for it tim who do you have as your first boot yeah i think i just mentioned it <laughs> um, yeah okay <laughs> i i think carson will probably go home first if um tika is the tribe that ends up at tribal um i think he's just gonna overplay or something I think I think he might panic too if they, if they end up being the tribe that loses right away. I could see him like feeling the pressure, feeling the heat a little bit. He's just young. He's I think the youngest player on this season at twenty. Um, I understand where you're coming from there. I had Carson as well, so not too interesting. <laughs> I, I just, he's gonna overplay fast, and he seems like a really nice guy. He, he's got a very inspiring story, but uh, I'm not sure he'll be a great player. Yeah. So who do you think is going to be like the fan favorite for this season? Yeah, um, I think the overall fan favorite is going to be Matt, um, the uh, the the barbershop owner Matt. We we do have two of them, uh, barbershop Matt. I think just he seems so fun. I think again he's going to have like good narrator energy. Um, I think he's going to be someone that we all enjoy watching. We look. I'm not sure he'll have a big role in the season per se, but I think he's going to be someone we we look forward to hearing when he does talk. Yeah, I, I think he's going to go home see... in heartbreaking fashion, and then that will only make us love him more. I could definitely see that as like the more reasonable fan favorite, but I've been hearing a lot about this Yam Yam Tram, kind of like how we had the Gabler Galleon last season oh, um, interesting. on Reddit. So I down. think I think a lot of people want want to see Yam Yam. I think he's got similar vibes to maybe like someone like Nasir. Um, yep, I, I completely see that comparison as well. Who's just like happy to be there, wants to do everything, and is a good I player. Know. Like I feel like this people don't put enough respect on this year's game. This year was finding advantages, and he just he got blindsided. I yeah, think Yamia comes the same fate, but I think both of them are going to be decent players of this game. Yeah, exactly. Um, and then getting down to it, who do you think will win Survivor Forty Four? Yeah, so that I could see a lot of different people doing. I had a couple that I really liked. Um, and this is going to be, I think, a surprising one for you, Tim, based on your reaction when we were talking about her in the broadcast or uh, when we were going through the, the tribes. But I'm a big Helen fan. I put a lot. I think Helen's going to be very good at this game. Uh, I think she's going to be kind of a central person in that tribe. So I'm not sure she goes home super early. And I think her interview and her like answers to questions inspired a lot of confidence in me that she is a very capable, smart, but willing to roll with the punches kind of person. I think who wants to be under the radar. And I think we're seeing under the radar is the way to win in the new era. Uh, I'm on the Helen train. Yeah, I can definitely see that fitting into that under the radar uh, bucket of winners that we've had the last few seasons. Um, I, and I gotta say, I agree on it. Um, I don't know. I've, I'm not someone who picks a winner every season. I just kind of go off of vibes from the earlier episodes and kind of pick people I like and cheer for. Um, Your point? I, I think, think we need to revisit this question after like an episode or two, and then we can be like, oh, no, here's who we actually want to win now that we know them a little better. Yeah, I mean, like, maybe I every episode we can, we can do that. Um, just we'll so never be wrong. It. Or we'll be wrong we'll every time. We'll every wrong. episode. Yeah. Um, I think... I'd probably have to go with Claire possibly as a winner pick. She seems like she's picking the right players um, as influences to win this game. And I think her background aligns with that a bit. Um, 
She's got the social game. Probably a sleeper strategist. I think that she has a good chance of winning this game and going pretty far. I think that's a fantastic pick, if we're being honest. That was my number two. I really liked what Claire brought to the table. Again, I am scared about her maybe not fitting in on the tribe initially. I think if she hits the merge, she is an incredibly dangerous player. Right. I'm not too tied to anyone right now. I just say from what I've read so far and seen, she seems like a good winner pick. Um, And the more Courtney Yates type screen time we can have the better. Yeah, so exactly. I'm all, down, I'm all down with that play. <laughs> all nice. right. And let's end so, here. Let's talk about a couple of our wishes that we have for this season. Some things we'd love to see. Um, what, what you got for me? Just, just one thing you want to see. Just one thing? No, well, one, um, at time, one at a time. One at a time. I'd say, I think a lot of these things on my list are probably not going to happen. Um, but is I'd the love auction to coming see back, them. Tim? Is that is that on your list? <laughs> it actually is on my list. Oh that my and it's not and coming back. And loved ones visit. I'd love to see that come back. Probably not going to come back. Um, that one could in later seasons. I don't think this one, but I, at forty five, we could see loved ones back. Yeah, I'd say the the number one thing I have right now is just kind of changes and tweaks with the editing. Um, probably a bigger focus on how people are interacting with each other in the yes. actual gameplay rather than spending time on people's backstories. I mean, it's great to hear, but at the same time, it's taking away from those interactions and understanding how people are playing the game. Um, I, I think I your find point. most entertaining. I think your point is right on here. We need to see more of just straight up them interacting with each other. I think that's the one thing that's really been missing from the last couple seasons. Um, in the edit, I think the edits have been really good the past couple. That's the one thing I I really don't like. I have a disagreement on where we need to pull that time from. I love the beware advantages. The beads, that was amazing. I liked the catchphrases. I think they're great. We just spent too much time on them. We don't need to spend 15 minutes collecting the beads. Like, show me (laughs) 13 minutes of strategy and then give me a two minute last second crazy as hell montage of them scrambling for the beads it gets your heart racing right before tribal you know what's the worst part about those advantages too is that we have three tribes and they show it for every single tribe right and you're seeing the same thing over and over again i guess you can have different results and different ways that people play the advantage but it's just too much screen time taken away from those interactions right i completely agree um, I'm just going to throw in a quick note, too. While we're on backstories you brought up, I really hope that we can get some backstories that are maybe a little less tragic in nature. I, I do feel like Survivor is getting a little like tragedy heavy with the backstories. Um, you know, I like to envision that Survivor is just people on a boat who got shipwrecked, right? And not everyone on your boat is going to be like uh, have overcome something absolutely massive in their lives. And I do like hearing some of those, but not everyone should have one of those. And I think it would just be nice to hear some a couple more maybe just standard stories. Here's who I am, you know? Yeah, and I think, I guess this kind of gets into representation too. Um, people like seeing those stories because those they kind of reflect our own stories in some ways. And that's good. It's just, it can be a Absolutely. little bit much and distracting and doesn't entirely have to do with what's going on in the island at all. Um I mean, it can definitely help as a viewer to have to make that connection and find someone that you want to cheer for. But I'd rather have that through the game than just like, hey, this person, I don't know, um, is also from Chicago or something. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> so, th- probably something more deep than that. This person also survived cancer or something. Um, but I'd I mean, rather have I- those connections. Yeah, I am going to pull for Sarah and Claire because uh, Claire was originally from Chicago before she moved to New York. So those two definitely do get an extra point in my book for that. True. Else. Yeah. Yeah. But I'd definitely rather see those connections in the game and like see that through their actual personality rather than like it almost seems like you're just kind of reading it off of a sheet of paper. Like, okay. we've yeah. kind of already heard these bios um, for some of these players. Yeah. So seeing it on screen again is just taking away time from the game and seeing how people actually play or um 
how they might act in social situations, which I think is more powerful connection and understanding people and um, mm-hmm. pulling for some people that you might get along with in real life. Yep. And while we're talking so, about kind of people, I'll bring up another one from my wish list if it's okay. I think this this season has a lot of strong female candidates, and I've been craving a female alliance for a while. And I feel like this would be a great season for a female alliance that comes up post merge. Just kind of a, a more out there one, but I think that'd be fun. Yeah, I think that'd be great too. I don't really have much of a much to say about that, but I I think that would be good to see. Um One thing that I had that's probably like these are all Hail Marys. Um, (laughs) One that I was saying was big move survivor coming back. I want to see like a truly dominant player. It was so refreshing to see like a player like Jesse last season after maybe two seasons, three seasons, however long of like, I don't even know. He he just seemed like someone you could really root for and was kind of dominating the game. Um, he just wasn't great at challenges and that was ultimately his downfall or making fire for that matter. Um, and challenges. He wasn't good at either. Yeah. Um, but I'd like to see a truly dominant player. I don't know who that would be on this cast, but I'd like to see that. Yeah, that, that's very fair. Um, I think one thing that we had both talked about a lot last season, I know we, we, we exchanged a lot of texts on this one. We got to change the tribal format up a little. It's, oh, it's yeah, so sure. stale. Oh yeah. my goodness, it's stale. Like every time they just come in, Jeff asks more or less the same question every time. And people are so poised. Like they don't, they know that they have to be very careful about what they say and they're not going to give much away. You know, you cast a bunch of super fans, they're going to play like super fans. And Survivor needs to adapt to that a little bit. Right now, tribal is truly a waste of 10 minutes of episode, uh, is my opinion. So we need yeah, to I, change. I 100 percent agree. I don't see much value in it anymore. I think that's definitely a part of the episode where I'm like pulling out my phone, <laughs> focusing on something else, um, because it's it's the same thing every week. It's Jeff pulling out these weird analogies. What was he talking about last season? Jaws, oh. the movie. Uh, no force. It and we need to cap analogies the po- per season. Yeah, and that's just the players responding and also analogies, and that's kind of like what they're what the edit is showing. You know they're there for like an hour or something recording tribal councils, and it's just it's rough. They should really pare that down a little bit. Mm -hmm. You got any more? Um, yeah, I also said better tribal councils like you said. Um, Maybe just pare it down on Jeff Probst in general. <laughs> um, My parents definitely agree. They, they complain about it every episode. I, I don't know what happened to Jeff. He's lost his mind. Yeah. <laughs> no, the monster got him, I'm pretty sure. <laughs> yeah. Um, I don't really have much else. I, I just kind of said bringing back some classic challenges, maybe the auction, Absolutely. maybe loved one visits, um, bringing back some of the things that we loved. The original intro with... Uh, Oh, the original. Don't tap me with a good time. Music. Ancient voices. Oh, so good. You know, those are all things that probably aren't coming back, but you'd love to see as a fan. I'll go for two more pragmatic ones real quick to end us up here. We got to see a successful shot in the dark soon. I really like the shot in the dark as a concept, but um, we're due. And also, I want to see like how the first one goes. I could see a situation where this is like an idol and, you know, the first one might be underwhelming or like a couple seasons of it was underwhelming. You know, you look back to Guatemala, that idol did nothing, like didn't add to the game very much. But now, you know, idols are so big. I think the shot in the dark has the potential to be like really, really influential in future Survivor. Um, And I want to see it come to fruition soon, because if not, they need to phase it out. Yeah, I'm going to be honest, I don't completely understand that whole concept of the shot in the dark um yeah i i really couldn't care less about some of these advantages i just love to see more survivor stuff more players interacting so right i feel like it just takes up too much screen time for it to not matter and we just haven't yeah. seen that yet yeah also so it's maybe gotta work or we gotta get rid of it 
also maybe like some of those boat trips to the advantage and what was it like the prisoners dilemma they're getting better at about stuff that. i they think were way great. shorter last season at least they're getting a little bit better but i you know i just don't really care for them throwing a bunch of um advantages and stuff at players and seeing how they react that's just not interesting survivor to me yeah that's fair i agree we gotta the the game's called survivor it's about surviving on an island not winning many games yeah right i'm gonna end on one last one let's get another fun winners edit up in here um i think erica's maybe wasn't quite as fun because the hourglass didn't work out but i thought marianne is kind of this uh spunky character who can you know still prove that you can win a game of survivor by being honest and by making like your one big move is really great and uh, i liked gabler's a lot again it felt weird on tribal night but i love look- looking back gabler was hiding in plain sight and he told us the whole time and i didn't see it and i thought that was awesome um i even think if you look at jesse's edit last season had jesse won they showed a really complex character a guy who really struggled to make big moves mm-hmm. because of the emotional ramifications i think that would have been a really satisfying winner's edit i think survivor's doing a really good job telling the story of the game right now and i hope they can tell the story of the interactions between players a little bit better yeah i 100 percent agree on that um there are definitely like the edit is everything it influences everything it's Um, If they can improve on that in any way, um, that would be great. I don't really like the winners from the past few seasons, so I won't (laughs) comment on that. But fair enough. um, Yeah, I like I said, I'd like to see someone who, like you know, I'd I'd like to see a, a winner where you know them really well at the end of the game. And I think in some of the past seasons, we strayed away from that and kind of had like surprise winners and you don't really feel like you know them at the end of the season i'd like to see like okay i want to know why this person should win um that kind of thing interesting division here tim i feel the opposite i like not knowing and i like being surprised at the end even if it creates a weird final tribal night it's more fun that way i think just by hiding some things in the edit it it just invites controversy in some ways. We saw that last season. People didn't feel like everyone was represented fairly. Um, Fair enough. Jumping Natalie to White conclusions seat. about yeah, <laughs> jumping in to conclusions about the jury and everything. Um, so I don't know. Just more clarity. You can't show all the hours of Survivor, but Survivor live cam when? <laughs> just kidding. <laughs> that would be amazing. Um, if you don't have anything else to add, I think we'll wrap up, right? I think you should go for it, Tim. Wrap up, send us home. All right. Well, this has been an episode of Buffs and Blindsides. Uh, we'll be back after this next episode, providing some analysis, um, our own takes, some fun stuff, all that good stuff. We'll be back in a little bit. See ya. <laughs>